understanding consciousness through psychedelics. Consciousness is that medium through which we perceive both the world that surrounds us and the world that lies within us. The blue of the sea and the pain in your knee are both aspects of your conscious mind. But though consciousness is, is that which is most familiar to each of us, it is also that which is most mysterious. Despite thousands of years of thought, we still cannot agree upon the relation between matter and mind, between the solid physical world and our seemingly intangible consciousness. Today, there's a renewed interest in this whole problem, known in modern science and philosophy as the hard problem of consciousness. Concurrently, there's a renewed interest in psychedelics. In fact, we are in the midst of the so-named psychedelic renaissance. There are currently far more advanced research projects on psychedelic states than there ever was in the 1960s. And, with more knowledge, we're moving away from the fearful propaganda against their use, which in retrospect seems more political than scientific. However, most psychedelic research today is concerned with the therapeutic medicinal properties of these chemicals. Of course, this is of great value, but psychedelics can also be of great value to the healthy as well as to the unhealthy, and to the philosopher as well as the physician. Psychedelics are much more than medicine. Psychedelic modes of consciousness can provide states that are awe-inspiring, sublime, ethereal, and infernal. Visions of the most beautiful and intricate of objects can be seen, but also the darkest terror. One can lose one's sense of oneself as oneself. It can shatter into a hailstorm of subjectivities. One's sense of space is often distorted. Time fluctuates or even disappears. One can attain completely novel feelings, emotions. And sense data can tangle to the extent that one may smell the color of time. As a philosopher of mind, one who studies mind-matter logic, the varieties of consciousness, and as a metaphysician, one who seeks the fundamental depths of reality, it seems obvious that to enhance our understanding of the mind requires the investigation of such psychedelically induced states of mind. That is, psychedelics may be means to advance the metaphysics of mind. Yet, there's little modern literature on the, philosoph on the uh, philosophy of psychedelic consciousness. There is, however, a hidden psychedelic history of philosophy that can be revealed, showing us how psychedelics have influenced great thinkers' understanding of consciousness. So let me take you on a trip. The great British philosopher Alfred North Whitehead is famous for saying that the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato has no doubt had a profound effect upon Western thought and culture. So it is interesting to see that it's likely that he derived his mind-matter theory from psychedelic intake. In the annual Eleusinian Mysteries, a religious event near Athens, Plato fasted and drank a potion of a specific dose that gave him heavenly visions. In the Phaedrus, he gives this ancient trip report. We saw the blessed sight and vision and were initiated into that which is rightly called the most blessed of mysteries. We looked upon perfect apparitions, which we saw in the pure light, being ourselves pure, not entombed in this which we carry about with us and call the body, in which we are imprisoned like an oyster in its shell. Dr. Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, argued that the potion that Plato and other ancient Greeks drank contained ergot, from which LSD is derived. For Plato, these visions fostered the mind-matter relation, that is, dualism, that the mind is separate from the matter of the body, and thus that the mind can escape the prison of the body to a higher realm. This is contrary to materialism, that, the, that all that exists is the body and the physical world. But it was Plato's dualism that had an effect upon Christianity and upon the notion that the soul survives the death of the body and upon much of later philosophy. So we see the power that psychedelics can have, not only upon an individual, but upon philosophies, cultures, and eras. 
As we are currently gathered here in the capital of Cornwall, we should note that the first thinker to scientifically study the effects of psychedelic substances was the great Cornishman and self-proclaimed chemical philosopher Sir Humphrey Davy, whose statue crowns the hometown, his hometown of Penzance. In 1799, Davy researched nitrous oxide to discover whether it was toxic or not. He soon discovered that it was not. In fact, quite the contrary, it was rather pleasant. <laughs> Unlike the carbon monoxide he also tried, which he didn't find pleasant at all. <laughs> For half the year 1799, Davy was inhaling 15 pints of nitrous oxide five times a day, every day. But this was not enough for him. <laughs> On Boxing Day, Davy steps inside an airtight box and takes 160 pints of the gas. As he steps out, he takes another 40 pints for good measure. This is his report. My visible impressions were dazzling and apparently magnified. I heard distinctly every sound in the room. I lost all connection with external things. I existed in a world of newly connected, newly modified ideas. With the most intense belief and prophetic manner, I exclaimed, nothing exists but thoughts. The universe is composed of impressions, ideas, pleasures, and pains. Nothing exists but thoughts. As we can see from his notebooks, Davy was alluding to the mind-matter philosophy, that is, idealism. The view that the material world around us is but a mental projection. Matter is mind. In Davy's final book, written in 1829, he talks about the spectacular visions that he bore throughout his life. In one vision, where he gazes upon some amazing alien city which sprouts giant blue glass columns. He gives an analogy which we can still use today to explain the psychedelic experience. He writes, You are now in a state in which a fly would be, whose microscopic eye was changed to one similar to that of man, and you are wholly unable to associate what you now see with your former knowledge. That is, what it is like to be a fly being a man is akin to what it is like to be a man tripping psychedelic. So Davy was brought to this incredible world of supreme visions and ideas through psychedelics, uh, to the philosophy of idealism. This philosophy, devised by thinkers such as Kant and Hegel, was more popular in Germany than the English-speaking world. But there was one notable English speaker who was also flung to the position in likewise fashion. That was a great psychologist and philosopher, William James who wrote that only under the influence of nitrous oxide could he fully understand Hegel's complex philosophy. Of course, I don't mention this to my students. <laughs> Another great thinker of the time, who also self-experimented with psychoactive drugs, was the great Friedrich Nietzsche, famous for his claim that God is dead. As a doctor, Nietzsche was able to prescribe any concoction of drugs whatsoever. His friends, however, noted it was odd that the pharmacist never asked to check whether his doctorate was in medicine or not. It wasn't. It was uh, in philology. But nonetheless, he got what he wanted. Although Nietzsche was severely critical of the god of Christianity, he often featured the god of intoxication in his work, Dionysus even claimed that it was his inspiration. Many thinkers who have tried psychedelics claim how inspirational to novel thought the chemicals can be. In 1935, the French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre needed to escape the drudgery of his situation. So he decided to take a large injection of the cactus drug mescaline. For Sartre, this led to his led to the essay on imagination, and also to the novel that made him famous, Nausea. But for Sarch, the mescaline experience had its price. For months thereafter, he noticed that he was being followed by giant lobsters. <laughs> of course, he knew they were not real, but this brought him little comfort, as it, thought, it made him think he was going permanently insane. 
as we enter the 20th century, psychedelics become more prevalent, and we see more intellectuals experimenting with them. In the 1950s, there was a planned outsight project, which sought to bring together the world's leading cognoscenti to each try uh, mescaline. Invitees included Graham Greene, A.J. Eyre, Carl Jung, and Albert Einstein. This was the greatest thing that never happened in psychedelia. Unfortunately, the funding was pulled at the last minute. But a decade later, then, the surge in the popular use of the drugs becomes incredible. And unfortunately, that leads to their criminalization, a prohibition which has, in my view, impeded the progress of both medicine and metaphysics. But now, as the prohibitions are beginning to pass, we can explore the potentials that these, these drugs can have on not only on our understanding of what consciousness, consciousness is, but also on our understanding of what consciousness can be. Firstly, we realize how very limited our common concept of consciousness is. There are far more states of sentience than we normally experience. Even dreams can appear hopelessly mundane compared to certain psychedelic states. And with such a realization, more radical theories of consciousness become more plausible, such as panpsychism, the view that all organisms, including plants, have at least basic forms of sentience. Secondly, with the distortions of spatio-temporality commonly induced via psychedelics, we see we gain a, a direct experience of the relativity of space and time. Einstein was fond of the idealist philosopher Kant, and it's fascinating to see how psychedelics can yield insights into the thoughts of these two thinkers. Thirdly, our self-consciousness undergoes radical transformations. As seen, the sense that you are one single consciousness can shatter. The division between the self and the world can be lost. The distinction between everything you know, your everyday assumed beliefs, can be exposed as in many ways completely arbitrary and stifling. Lastly, not only can psychedelics seemingly increase one's intelligence and efficiency through microdosing, taking a minute dose of a psychedelic, but they can generally lead to a heightened awareness of the subtleties around and within us. That is, Psychedelics can enhance our consciousness, pushing us up the evolutionary ladder. Nietzsche replaced God with his notion of the enhanced human, or the Superman. The first British writer on Nietzsche was A.R. Uraj, who claimed that new modes of consciousness will be needed, as the mystics have always declared. The differencing element of man and Superman will be the possession of these. Could psychedelics facilitate the so-called transhumanism, the transformation of mankind into a greater being? And moreover, could psychedelics not only aid ourselves, but the world in which we live? Through psychedelics, one frequently gains a much heightened appreciation of the worth of nature and the beauty and value of her creatures. Even one such experience can make a person more conscious and concerned with the ecology of our planet. So I say, psychedelics should once more be taken seriously as intellectual and aesthetic instruments that can help us understand not only what consciousness is, but what we humans really are and what we can become in our relation to the wonder that is nature. Thank you.